Hallelujah. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. Last year, I, I started a series on navigating Bible prophecy by Zion. We had focused in on just what spiritual strength is and how vitally important it is to be strong if we are really going to wage spiritual warfare as soldiers of the cross. Now, one of the key points in understanding our spiritual strength is to understand that before we can walk victoriously in the spirit, we, we need to address our brokenness. There are many people that are broken. And we need to address our brokenness through a sanctification. We've got to be sanctified. And through a sanctification that addresses us wholly. Our spiritual strength begins with us being strengthened within the triparts of our being. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. God formed a person from the dust of the ground. That's our physical body. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's our spiritual being. So that he became a living being. King James says a living soul. Our soul is our will, our emotions, and our intellect, amen? You see, in taking this holistic approach to our being strengthened, to our being strong, last year we also got into addressing those things that weaken us and make us unable to stand up for Jesus as the brave soldiers of the cross that he has called us to be. See, many times the foes that we have to vanquish for Christ to be Lord are not as much on the outside as they are on the inside. As Galatians 5 and 17 states, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You see, there's a, a constant battle going on. There's a constant battle going on on the inside of us between our old carnal and fleshly nature, <laughs> the flesh, and our pneuma life, our spirit man. Uh, our pneuma life, our spirit man, and our carnal nature, the flesh, are in conflict with each other. With the end result, sometimes, or maybe too often, being that we don't do the things that we know that we should be doing. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Those things that we are convicted by the Holy Spirit to do. Now, now we began a series last year on the manifested works of the flesh of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, 19 to 23, to be exact. And this is a clear list of some of those key things, the, the manifested works of the flesh, that will keep us out of heaven and cause us to go to hell. Sister Omi, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 23. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand 
Just as I also told you in the time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So I don't care how moral or how intellectual you become. If you're living in sin, you ain't going to heaven. And if you miss heaven, you will catch hell. Amen? You see, we have this prevailing attitude in our societies that we can, and it's, I admire people that do noble deeds, that we can do all this noble stuff. And we get so intellectual about it that we can build houses for p poor people and, and we can um, have wonderful soup kitchens and all that. Don't get me wrong. All that stuff is, is good because faith without works is dead. But if you're looking for that to get you into heaven, <laughs> that ain't going to work. <laughs> Before we got to the list of those manifested works, as listed in uh, verses 19 to 21, the apostle Paul made a powerful point in his epistle to those early Christian communities in the Roman province of Galatia that if they... And we can personalize it. And if we are led by the Holy Spirit, then we are no longer under the law. But you see, you got to look out here because there is a danger here because a popular interpretation of our not being under the law leads people to raise an argument that justifies our breaking the law without there being any consequences <laughs> because of liberty and grace. But, but then if this was so, th then the Apostle Paul would not have proceeded to present us with a list of the manifested works of the flesh that can cause us to go to hell. Amen? Y you see, we have to be careful in our interpreting not being under the law, that we don't misinterpret it as our being free to live however we want, even it produ if it produces an illogical and lawless state that displeases God. Because this would be absolutely contradictory to the word of God. Because Jesus does not terminate the law and Torah, he brings the element of grace. Love that song, Marvelous Grace. Grace. <laughs> when we get what we don't deserve. He brings the element of grace by which we are saved from the curse of the law and this grace that we receive by our faith. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 2 says, Therefore, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You, you, you see... That's your anchor when you're going through rough times. That's your anchor when you go through the loss of a loved ones. We have that promise that we have an eternal hope of his glory that will be manifested for us. Touch your neighbor and say, hold on. <laughs> See, you got to hold on. Because many things will come to shake your faith. But we got to hold on. There is a grave danger for those of us that walk in this freedom, though. We got to be careful. And this danger, it comes to us right from within the walls of some of our churches. Hmm. This danger is one posed to us 
the individual and to the body of Christ as a whole. It comes from the spirit of religion that inhabits those that do not walk in the freedom of Christ. You see, you could easily tell people that are inhabited by a spirit of religion. They got this self-righteous attitude about them. <laughs> Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, man. <laughs> Amen? Just as in the days of Yeshua, Jesus, and his challenges from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I always say sad, you see, is a reason they sad, <laughs> and scribes, there are some very distinctive characteristics that were operational in them that are still operational in the spirit of religion today. Now, we addressed quite a few of them. It, it, it's in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. Sister Kelly, Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to verse 40. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. So um, these self-righteous people, and they're still around, they have this attitude about them. When you see them, they, they don't, they don't want to sit anywhere low. They got this uh, stuck-up, <laughs> we call it, way about them. Uh, see, you are either a victim, because a lot of people out there, they've been hurt by these people. Or you are an offender. I don't care who you are. <laughs> if you're doing it, you need to stop. <laughs> or you are going to be a defender. Because we're going to be in a position where we need to help some of these people get over the hurt and the pain that these people with the spirit of religion cause. Now from this one scripture, Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. I think you remember that we picked out a couple points. Amen? Point one, they measure spirituality by works. They measure spirituality by works. Mask and apparel. <laughs> Some of them go around all dressed in white. And they just as wicked as you want to meet. <laughs> you can't dress holy. <laughs> and not personal intimacy and brokenness with God. Point number two. They love to be worshipped. And are often hypersensitive when not continuously praised. In other words, when you get in a conversation with them and if you miss and start to share what God did for you, watch and see how quickly they switch the conversation <laughs> to just how wonderful they are. <laughs> <laughs> Point number three, religious spirits cause the people that they affect to have a puffed up, puffed up sense of pride which is often accompanied by a spirit of entitlement. I see entitlement every day, and, and my wife says, yes, God is dealing with you. With people that you know, I always say, you let them out in traffic, and they don't even need to look your way. It's like, you had to do that for me. <laughs> but you've got some people in church that have this sense of entitlement, and they all walk around, they pretend to be humble, but they are far from humble. 
<laughs> Mark 12 and 40. Beware of the scribes which devour widows, houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Point number four. They heartlessly trample over the poor or people they deem to be less blessed or gifted than them. <laughs> That's wrong. You see, we may all have different gifts in life, but you ain't no better than me, and I ain't no better than you. Amen? Amen. Point number five, they are great showmen. Da -da 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 -da. Hey! <laughs> or show women they know how to put on a great show with regards to them appearing to be operational in the gifts and things of God sometimes you can get to the point where it all becomes a science and you can study people and study their emotions and study their responses. And instead of you living right and doing right, only thing people become to you are tools to be manipulated. Point number six, their gifts are carnally based and not spirit led. See, don't confuse skill with anointing. The anointing will deliver. The anointing will cast out demons. The anointing will break generational curses. Skill, however, duplicates anointing, and it looks at all the habits and the practices and the culture of the anointing, and it tries to duplicate it, but there is no power there. No power to break any curses. No power to bring your healing from God's presence. No power to bring deliverance. Their gifts are carnally based and not spirit led. See, if you are a gifted person, you got to take your gift and you got to give that back to Jesus Christ. And watch and see how God uses your gifting. That's what I love with our praise team here. They sing under the anointing. See, I'm a worshiper. Don't take me away from worship. Even when I travel, I like to be right in God's presence because that's when I get my download sometime. And these people, they got things figured out too fast to slow, and then you come out walking like you're holy. <laughs> no, let me get in God's presence. Let me stay in God's presence. I know a lot of people ain't going to like me for preaching this, but I don't care. <laughs> Amen. Their gifts are carnally based and not spirit-led, which means that what they produce will seldom lead people into God's presence or into a closer walk with him. See, when the anointing comes, you know how you can tell the difference? When the anointing comes, it should cause you to get into a situation where you can really feel God's presence. Sometimes you'll weep. Sometimes you'll just be so broken. But when you've had a good performance, this is what you do. Wonderful. That was just great. You shouldn't be applauding for God when he shows up. God, God, God ain't getting no salary for... <laughs> There's a difference. Amen? Point number seven. Those led by the spirit of religion, they strategically give to influence leaders and to make themselves look good. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what you got. These power brokers, what they do is they come and they like to manipulate the church. They like to manipulate the pastor. You know your pastor ain't for sale. <laughs> but they will come and they will give and 
you'll be so moved and they, they'll even look holy about it. And then they want to call and say, you know, there's some things we need to change. See, uh, I know why God called bad boys off the street. Because I'm a billy goat. <laughs> I'm not for sale. <laughs> Mark chapter 12. Verses 41 to 44. Papa V. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, but put in everything, all she had to live on. You see, I know that our ministry will come into contact with multi-millionaires. <coughs> that ain't a prophecy, that's a reality. But if a multi-millionaire decides that, oh, I'll give you 10,000, and he knows he's got 100 million, and a little lady that has, say, just $100 in the bank, she comes and she gives 50 of that. The little lady gave more than that multi-millionaire. Amen? The kingdom principle here is that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, this kingdom principle is also why Jesus enjoyed sitting by the treasury. <laughs> because, be, because those that will not give, those that will not give him his due, are not fully committed. Amen? Hmm. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. I want to hit two points out of this. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. Sister Ke two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted see see uh the point here with um identifying key characteristics is that they tend to often be people that have the spirit of religion very judgmental and they are intolerant of other people. <clears throat> and the thing about them, whether you find them in the political arena or whether you find them in your church, is that they are unable to see the sin in their own lives. <laughs> so you got to be careful. Watch Pastor get in trouble. You got to be careful not to allow righteousness to become a tool on your political platform. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. Sydney, get this in the co complete Jewish Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Don't judge, 
so that you won't be judged. For the way you judge others is how you will be judged. The measure with which you measure out will be used to measure to you. Why do you see the splinter in your brother's eyes, but not, not, but not notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, when you have the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly, so that you can remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Don't give to dogs what is holy, and don't throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, then turn and attack you. So in other words, some people don't even waste your time with. Some people who will not receive what you have, do not waste your time. Some people you ain't going to never save because they are hell bent on enjoying themselves and they could care less about what's in the Bible. Stop beating yourself up. If I could just say this another way, maybe they would understand it. No. Some of them, they know what's better in the Bible. They know what's in the Bible better than we do. You see, we also have to be merciful because God is merciful. And be careful about judging. It says, judge not and ye shall not be judged. You see, every time you point at someone, you got three fingers pointing back at you. <laughs> Amen. The, the other point from Luke 18, 10 to 14, is that those that are led by the religious spirit <laughs> use righteousness as a vehicle to condemn other people while not adhering to the standards that they preach. It's as bad as having someone with a cigarette in their hand telling you, don't smoke, man, this thing will kill you. You follow some of these people home that like to condemn people? And you'd be surprised to see what you find. Self-righteous people forget the scripture that says all have sinned. And they believe that some sins are worse than others. They like to point out you know, um, man, why this sissy don't get saved? And yes, they do need to get saved. But what makes you think being a sissy is any worse than being a liar? Or being a cheat? Or having hatred in your heart? <laughs> sin is sin. They, uh, they believe that they can do a lot of works and bring salvation. That's a lie. Point number 10. Those led by the spirit of religion. And this is a deep one. They know the letter of the law, but they miss the spirit of the law. Sister Sonia, Romans chapter 7, verses 6 to 12. You see, as she comes, let me explain what this is all about. You see, the letter of the law is defined as the strict and exact force of the language used in a statute as distinguished from the spirit, the, the general purpose and policy of the statute. In our understanding, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law, when we obey the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law, we are obeying the literal interpretation of the words, the letter of the law, but not the intent of those who wrote the law. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Conversely, when, when one obeys the spirit of the law, 
but not the letter, one is doing what the authors of the law intended, though not necessarily adhering to the literal wording. Romans chapter 7, verses 6 to 12. Sonia, hit it. But now we are discharged from the land and have terminated all intercourse with it, having died to what once restrained and held us captive, so we serve not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the spirit in newness of life. What then do we conclude? Is the law identical with sin? Certainly not. Nevertheless, if it had not been for the law, I shall not have recognized sin or have known its meaning. For instance, I would not have known about covetedness, <laughs> would have had no consciousness of sin or sense of guilt. If the law had not repeatedly said, you shall not covet and have an evil desire for the one thing and another. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment to express itself, got a hold on me and aroused and stimulated all kinds of forbidden desires, lust, covetedness. For without the law, sin, sin is dead. The sense of it is inactive and a lifeless thing. Once I was alive, but quite apart from and unconscious of the law. But when the co commandment came, sin lived again and I died. I was, sent was sentenced by the law to death. And the very legal ordinance, which was designed and intended to bring life actually proved to me to mean to me death for sin seizing the opportunity and getting a hold on me by taking its incentive from the commandment be gilded and entrapped it and cheated me and using it as a weapon killed me the law therefore is holy and each commandment is holy and just and good uh. That, that's got to be the Amplified Bible. Amen? Amen? So those led by the spirit of religion, they know the letter of the law, but they miss the spirit of the law. See, God has called us to walk in dominion individually and as the body of Christ. But our manifested fruit of the spirit will determine his image here on earth. The spirit of the law is practiced in the fruit of the spirit which must be operated by love. That, the kind of love where we love Adonai with all our heart and with all our being and with all our resources. That's why the Shema is so awesome. <laughs> it says, Hey, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. See, love is the link that writes God's law on our inner parts, and the Holy Spirit is the hand that holds the pen. <laughs> Amen? This was prophesied of old, Sister Maribel. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 31 to 33. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 33. See, you've got to imagine that this great love was prophesied. See, there's no way you could keep all the commandments of God. But if you got the love of God in your heart, the love of God, will enable you to do what you do not out of an obligation or out of compulsion or not because that is a way to be holy, but quite naturally when the Holy Spirit fills your heart and your soul, you will do it because you love God. This was prophesied of old 
by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 33. Sister Maribel. Mm -hmm. The new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new hmm. covenant with the house of the Israel and the house of Ju Judiah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the <laughs> Lord. For these is the covenant that will make the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Here's the key. I will put my law with them, and I will write <laughs> it on their hearts. And <laughs> I will be the, their gods, and there shall be people. Amen. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, <laughs> saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their inquinity, and I will remember their sin no more. Amen. Amen. So, so who, 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 who is writing the law on our hearts? The Holy Spirit. And the ink is love. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. Kenrick, you want to get that one for me? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. See, you cross-reference scripture to make sure that you are reading things in the right. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Amen. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Amen. So the Holy Spirit has written the law of God in our hearts. And love is that ink. Amen. See, I'll show you why this is so important. Our understanding the letter of the law Versus the spirit of the law is a very important issue and topic because through it, we can effectively address such issues and Judaic traditions that cause conflict in the body. Let me name them. One, the curse of the law versus the gift of love. Point number two, the tradition and custom of circumcision. <laughs> Point number three, eating kosher. Eating kosher. <laughs> the next point is tithing. The next point is celebrating the Judaic feast. The next point is the relevance of the Ten Commandments today. And the next one is Sabbath observance. These are vital topics that need to be properly and biblically addressed if we are going to be knowledgeable and empowered as Judeo-Christian believers. So I will not do that today, but I'll do it next week. This is a provocative topic for many. So I am sure that it will be very interesting for many of us that embrace the Judaic part of our faith but do not want to be held in bondage of the letter of the law. Amen? This morning I want to focus on prayer. Because our spiritual strength in all of this begins with being strengthened within the tri parts of our being. 1 <laughs> Thessalonians 5 and 23 it says, And the very God of peace... That's Jehovah Shalom. Sanctify. Her original Greek word here is hagiadzo. <laughs> it means to separate from profane things and to dedicate to God. Separate <laughs> yourselves. You holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless 
unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we go back to where we started as we conclude. God formed a person from the dust of the ground. That's the physical body. Here's the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, it brings healing for sickness. And it can cause spiritual surgery to take place for those that have been abused or for those that have been abusers. Because too often the abuser is an abused victim themselves. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A spiritual being, the first thing it's needed is to be saved. Some people can sit up in church for years. And they know the hymns of the church. They know the custom of the tradition of their denomination. But they ain't saved. I sat up in church, in a traditional church for years. You know what I used to do before I went to church? I used to drink cream sherry. Because I said, I don't want to drink hard liquor for Sunday morning. <laughs> It's amazing how the devil will mess up your mind. And man, you couldn't beat me singing. What a fellowship. What a joy is mine. <laughs> Leaning. And I was just as, I was grooving, man. <laughs> you know? Because it was up here. It wasn't down here. Plenty of people sitting up in our churches need to get saved. Only thing church for them is is a tradition. Their mommy did it, their daddy did it, Uncle Harry did it. And for some people that are really devious, they use church as a dating place. You know, some really good girls go to church, man. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna see if I can get me in there and get me one of them honeys up there. Yeah. <laughs> no, get saved. Don't come to church for anything other than to meet Jesus Christ. Don't even come go to church for the pastor. Because too many of these pastors think they're God anyway. There is one God. So the first thing they got to do is get saved. And then we got a lot of Christians that only thing they got is salvation. They stay babes in Christ for all their life. They get one verse of scripture and they live off that for 10 years. Some of them, they even go to churches and, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong now because sometimes it feels like fire shut up in your bones. But if you go into a church and you can't say what was taught in church, like Wednesday, you say, what happened in church? Boy, we dance. <laughs> Let me tell you, we really dance. No, no, no. What did the pastor have to say? What did the pastor teach? And you wait, and the he was really good. <laughs> You're sitting up in the wrong place. Don't get me wrong, I love, I'm, I love emotion, but I feed me. If you feed my mind, then my mind will go through a process of transformation. Because I wasn't always saved. I remember quite well one Christmas, and let me show you, even before you get saved, sometimes the hand of God will save you and protect you. I was so drunk one Christmas till when I woke up, I was on the top of a roof. And I woke up just in time to see where I was going to roll down to. And if I had died in that state, I don't have to put it in a nice way. I was going straight to hell. Thank you. I would have bust hell wide open. It's right. But you got to grow. It's good to have emotion. And, you know, to say you don't have emotion is, is, to, is, is to be foolish. Some people, they have no emotion in church, but you let the dolphins be playing or the heat be playing. I shout for the heat, too. Don't get me wrong now, because I, I like the heat. You know, I wasn't always a Heat fan. You know, I had to be faithful to Miami, and before that I was with the Lakers. But if you could get excited about 
sports. How much more the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But uh, while you're getting that excitement, you need to get a greater commitment to your spiritual development. Churches nowadays don't do deliverance. A lot of pastors say, man, that stuff will work you. But if you got the anointing of God, as many of my brothers do, if you got the anointing of God and you flow in the gift of the Spirit, it's a sin not to go through deliverance for those people that are demonically possessed or demonically oppressed. You can't always be pretty in church worrying about, you know, man, I mess up my suit. This is a $500 suit, man. You got you're spitting up and stuff on me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> You'd be surprised what goes on behind the scenes. So that he became a living soul. A lot of people have damaged souls. They got disappointment with leaders. And they got disappointment with people in their lives that get in a position of trust and then just break their hearts. <laughs> we may need deliverance from the wrong mindset because a lot of people are in bondage of the law and they got generational error and they pass that as religion. 